scared them away, though. I'm telling you what, Wednesday night's a little light, huh? I'm just teasing, just kidding, but uh, I would encourage, if you've got those around you um, that are maybe still out or maybe still hesitant, I would give them just a little bit of encouragement. Um, you know, that we've been able to come, the Lord's been blessing and growing and some of those different things, and as they feel comfortable to return, you know, encourage them that they ought to do so as soon as they're comfortable. So we'd love to see their faces, love to take care of them. Amen. And uh, it's easier to do that when you can see somebody face to face. It always is. So invite those people and maybe just put a word out to them. As well as this, if you know somebody who hasn't been in a while, make sure that you are uh, maybe keeping up with them. Maybe let them know that you're praying for them or thinking about them. You know, those those things go a long way, not just from the, the office of the church, but also from the, the people of the church. It means a lot when it comes from the people. So make sure that we are uh, very concerned with the souls in the church and the people that, that we know and love. We want to take care of those guys. So. So anyway, keep those guys in mind, okay? Well, uh, as far as announcements go, I'm excited to announce that our junior church has officially kicked off as of last Sunday morning. And so if you have grandkids, nieces, nephews, whoever it is, kids, uh, that age, we will be meeting in the classroom in the back. If you've not had the opportunity to tour the building yet, uh, feel free to do so. There's a classroom on the back side of this hallway. Um, that's where we'll do our junior church every Sunday morning, amen? And so uh, we'll have a program for the kids as well as on Wednesday nights, uh, the van is going and we are picking up those teenagers and so we are full swing with our teens again as well as well as Sunday school for them on Sunday morning so if you've got teenagers that are that uh, that age group uh, they are more than welcome to join the Sunday school class and uh, be able to you know learn on a different level uh, for their age group and we love to be able to do that okay so I just want to remind you about uh, some of those different things the church has going as well as Saturday morning our outreach program and again I would encourage you that is for everybody it's not just for those uh, that find talent in that area uh, what better time to join than when we can't talk to people anyway amen <laughs> all you've got to do is walk and, and, and put a flyer in the doorknob and uh, we've got some different locations I realized maybe I scared some people when I talked about all those stairs that we climb that's just the apartment complexes there are so many different houses and neighborhoods and different things like that all through uh, but tell you, we don't all go to the apartment complex. It's just my group usually does because I like to jog up those stairs and work off of that quarantine. You know, <laughs> work off that quarantine weight just a little bit. So, so anyway, it's uh, feel free to come. It's for everybody. I'd encourage you. We have a great time. The Lord has brought fruit. Uh, we're praying for continued fruit. And again, I think that when all this is over, uh, we're going to see what the Lord has really done through all this time. And I'm excited to see it. I, I know you are too. Uh, but we need to be very invested in those times. And so again, that time is on Saturday morning. That's at nine o'clock. We'll do a small breakfast. By small breakfast, I mean donuts and coffee. Uh, I love donuts and coffee, amen, especially when it's free. All you gotta do is show up and uh, that's the best kind of coffee and donuts as, as far as it goes for me. Um, so we'll have that for you. And then we usually try to get out at 10. That's usually what time we try to break out. 
And uh, if you've got somewhere to be that day, don't worry. As long as you're with us for a little bit, that's all we care about, okay? So uh, whatever time slot you're available for that morning, come join us. You've got to leave early, that's fine. Uh, but we sure would love to have your hands helping us uh, pass out as many tracks as we can. Amen? Isn't that good? And so we'll try to do that. And again, if you're somebody who's concerned with germs and some of those different things, we wear face masks when we go. Um, and the CDC came out months ago and said that it doesn't live on surfaces. So it's not like we're passing germs. We're not doing anything like that. Uh, we're just doing what our responsibility is to the Lord, which is telling people the gospel. Amen? And we're doing it in a very safe way by putting those tracks on the door handles. So uh, we'll continue to do so um, as long as we're able. Amen? So that is Saturday morning. That covers our uh, Sunday morning, Sunday schools, uh, some of those different things, as well as the, the last announcement I would have. We are right now in the thought process of doing some kind of splash weekend um, for the kids. That's going to have to be sometime here in August. And so if you are, I know Sunday morning I announced it. I think a couple people forgot um, and, and walked out. We, we had a small children's ministry meeting uh, Sunday morning. We had a good little crowd. But if you are interested in being involved in children's ministry, please let us know. Uh, and again, we'll talk through some of those uh, different events that are, are coming up, uh, especially pertaining to that splash weekend and maybe some of what we can do. Uh, we've got a big field, and as long as they got water, right, that's enough. We can, we can do something with that. So uh, the kids will love it. So if you are interested, please let us know, and we'll get some of those, those puzzle pieces put together as the Lord leads. Amen. And so that's the key there. The Lord put those people in place. As far as that's going to go, I think that, that does us. So we'll do our praises and prayer requests, and I'll start us off with the praise tonight. Amen.
right, if you're following along your books, page 23 talks about Jesus' blood. There is power in the blood. If you'll stand with me, we're going to sing the first, the second, and the fourth verse. Page 23, if you're following along in the book. <laughs> your burden of sin. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you breathe full of victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the prayer. chapter 5, if you've got your Bible tonight, walk through a, a few verses, and again, I'm so thankful to be able to read through and just study God's Word, amen? I don't know about you, but I feel like some of the most valuable times of my week, and I, 
know, in fact, the most valuable times of my week are when I can sit down early in the morning, get my Bible out and read and study, and, and I'm telling you what, God communicates with me, I'm telling you. He does. He communicates with me he, in, in verses that, uh, you know, sometimes I've read so many times the Lord will, will bring out new truth and new things in life, and I'm telling you, we all need that time. And so I don't know who it is that needs to hear that, but, but man, if you don't have that time and if you don't have that place, get that time and get that place. Make a time. I know for uh, mothers, right, with kids, it's hard sometimes to get that time. But everybody needs that time. Find that place. Find that time where you can get alone with the Lord and really study and know God's Word. So tonight we're going to read through and, again, study some of the Lord's Word in John, uh, 1 John chapter 5 and verse number 1. Uh, we're going to start. The Bible says this, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ uh, is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, uh, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith. The first couple of verses there in uh, 1 John chapter 5 begins to talk about our relationship uh, with other believers. Amen. And I believe that that's a very important part of uh, church and, and, and some of our lives, you know, as we see believers and no believers and, and some of those different things, our relationships are very important, especially how we maintain those things. And so here's what it says in, in verse number one. It says, who shall believe that the Jesus is the Christ? So first of all, that's me. Amen. I believe Jesus is the Christ. That should be you. Uh, if you're sitting in this church and you don't believe that, you're probably in the wrong church. Amen. We believe in Jesus. I know some people say that's the Jesus problem, but we believe in Jesus. So Jesus is the Christ. That's me. It's talking to me. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Son of God, it says this, uh, and everyone that love him, love him also, uh, I'm sorry, the love that begat him, love also who is begotten of him. So if you love God, you're also going to love who is begotten of God, right? So who was begotten of God? Well, we know Jesus was begotten of God. So not only do we love God the Father, but also we love the Son. And so also the Bible says this, that not only do we love Jesus who is begotten of God, but also we love those that are begotten of Jesus. And so those people that have accepted the Holy Spirit, that have been saved, that is you and me, right? It's easy to, to look at people and, and not have that place in your heart for them. Uh, we all know those people that uh, just get on our nerves a little bit. We've talked about that a lot recently. Maybe somebody... Uh, needs to hear. I don't know. The, the Holy Spirit keeps bringing up these verses that somebody needs to hear. Uh, but, but, you know, we've all got those people that, that just rub us the wrong way or, or you know, that, that we don't want to get along with. And, and I would caution you when you start to think like that or when you start to have those thoughts, God says that we ought to love believers. Amen. We ought to love those people. Why? Because they have the Holy Spirit of God inside of them as well. Right. And the Holy Spirit does not reject itself. God does not not like himself, right? He, he obviously loves the Son, and so everybody who has the Son needs to be loved of every believer. And so you and I need to have this mindset that, you know what, we might have differences, and we might have things that we don't agree on, amen? Is it okay to agree to disagree? Yes, absolutely, amen? We can agree to disagree, not when it comes to doctrine, amen? Doctrine is something that we need to stand on, but when it comes to silly things, we don't have to agree on everything. We can get along even though we don't agree on every different little detail. In fact, you, you've you probably been offended by somebody in the church at some point, right? Whether you talk, I mean, you talk to somebody about parenting for five minutes, right? Somebody's going to get offended. <laughs> somebody doesn't believe in whoopings or somebody doesn't believe in uh, yada yada. You know, you, you talk for five minutes with somebody, you probably already found something you don't agree with. You'll find things like that all through life. We'll find them every day, constantly, and this will shock you even with believers. Amen? It'll, it'll, it'll happen even with those people that are saved, those people that you're working with to accomplish the cause of Christ, it just happens. And so we've got to love those people, get through those things, of course, moving forward for the gospel's sake. And that's what it's all about. We've got the Holy Spirit of God inside of us, and that's what we're trying to accomplish is his will in the world. And so I can put aside my preferences, I can put aside my uh, different views on some different things, and I can go with somebody to accomplish God's will. Amen? Can we do that? We can do that. That's not too much for the Holy Spirit to ask. So he says this. He says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God. 
So if you're somebody who finds a, a hardship in loving the children of God, the Bible brings it back to your relationship with God. He says, we know we love the children of God because we love God, right? And so a key point of that relationship is, I love God, and because I love God, I therefore love his children. And so it's a very good indicator of where our relationship with the Lord really is, the, the relationship that we have with those people around us and how we feel about them. Uh, if you're somebody who dreads coming to church in the morning because of those people, right, and, and you just are sorrowful about being in God's house because you know that you'll have to be uh, around whoever it is, I'm telling you, check where you're at and make sure your relationship is right with the Lord because you ought to love people no matter who they are, what they do, or, or, uh, or who they are. I, I've heard of some nasty people inside of the church, man. Nasty people that people feel make people feel not welcome. Uh, they make people feel like they're less valuable. They make people feel like they should be spit out and thrown out. And I'm telling you what, that is not what God's house should be. Amen? God's house is somewhere that everybody belongs. It's somewhere where uh, we're all sinners, amen? Uh, and we have the right to worship the Lord. And nobody should hinder or nobody should get in the way of somebody else's ability to worship God. And so if that's you, listen, be weary. Change that attitude. And if it's you who's offended, folks, walk in the door, whether it's a visitor or somebody that you know that you've got a chip on your shoulder about, listen, don't you dare let that thing affect their relationship with God. Don't you dare be a stumbling block to the people walking in the door. They have a relationship with God that is far more important than your preferences or the little silly human interactions that we have day in and day out. Amen. So we ought to love our brothers and sisters. We love the world, don't we? Amen. We love those that are lost and we love their souls. We ought to love our brothers and sisters too. We ought to get along and, and, and really love each other and support each other. So verse number four says this. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Verse number four tells me a whole bunch of things. In fact, we could stop and, and just preach on verse number four. I want you to see something very crucial for you and I to understand, and that is that whatever is born of God has already overcome the world. Now listen, I know we touched on it on Sunday morning, this overcoming the world and, and, and some of these different things. But, but here's what you've got to realize. If something is begotten of God, if something is born of God, it's already born with that victory over the world. It's not a fight that it's going to have to fight. It's not something that it's going to have to go through and potentially win, right? It's something that has already happened. That victory is already won. And so here's what he's saying to you and me. He says, we already have that victory. Why? Because we were begotten of God. I've been saved. I was born again. I believe that's one of the best ways to put it. Uh, when you're speaking to somebody, we're born again, right? We're saved. We become something completely different than what we were. The moment that I was born again, the moment I was saved, I became something that had already overcome the world. So what's it mean to overcome the world? Friend, it doesn't just mean that you and I have the victory in the end. It means that we have victory day in and day out. What does that mean for you and me? That means that sin no longer has a hold on you and me in our everyday life. And somebody say amen to that. It no longer has a hold in those different places of life where sin used to have strongholds. The moment that you and I were born again, God gave us freedom in each and every one of those categories in our life where sin reigned. I use a simple illustration many times when I talk to folks about sin and, and what happens when we're uh, saved. Uh, you know, it, it's simply, simply put, it's like a, if you have handcuffs on. Right, and, and the only way to get those handcuffs off is to take a key. Well, Jesus was that key to those handcuffs. The moment that we got saved, those handcuffs fell off. And so now if you and I are still in sin, it's because we're dressing up. We're putting the cuffs back on. They're not locking. They can't lock anymore. They're busted. They don't, they don't lock anymore. You can't lock those handcuffs. Satan can't chain you up. He can't put you in a dungeon. He can't do anything. Why? Because that key or those cuffs have already been busted. You're just wearing them for fun. Really, if you think about it, that's pretty silly. And so why do you and I sin, and why do we allow our sin nature to come forward? It's not because we're slaves anymore. It's because we are allowing sin to reign in our bodies. And so you and I have been made free from sin, and we've got to realize what that really means. It means that we have overcome the world already. We're not a slave to sin anymore. You know, the Bible says that before we were saved, we were literally slaves of sin. We were, we were literally bondage to iniquity. That's what we were. We lived in bondage to iniquity. That's not us any longer. We live a different kind of life now that Jesus lives inside of us. We're not, we're not captive to that thing anymore. And so you and I have already overcome the world. We were destined to overcome the world. Amen. 
And I'll remind you once again that God's plan will overcome all the different things happening in our world today. It's kind of threefold, right, when you look at it. It's not just us who overcome sin, but God has already overcome the world. And all the things that happen are just simply uh, playing out of what God said would happen in his will. So it's easy for you and me to sit back and rest and, and not get caught up in all the panic and different things of life. It's easy to see that God's got this whole thing in his hands and he's going to accomplish his will. Amen? It's easy to see. So verse number six says this. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. And then I want you to do this. If you're somebody who's got a Schofield Bible, uh, there are, are many commentators and many people who have written some really good notes. I thank them because I use them all the time. I like to track down the verses I'm going through and I like to better study using some of the verses that relate and that wouldn't be possible without some of these men, but with that being said, they're not always right. Uh, they, are, they are not always right in what they say. Sometimes their notes can be wrong. And uh, Mr. Schofield here uh, puts it, and you see a little O next to verse number seven. If you follow that O to the center column where he records his notes, uh, he says that it is generally agreed that verse number seven has no power or authority and can be omitted. I don't believe that at all. I believe God's word is God's word, amen? And if none of God's word, or I'm sorry, if, if some of God's word isn't God's word, then none of God's word is God's word. God's word is God's word. And so we can't omit any verses from the Bible. Uh, for, for Mr. Schofield to say that we can just take that verse out and, and, and keep on plugging and chugging, uh, to me, is completely uh, a farce. That's not true. God's word is God's word. He inspired it. He ordained it. Amen. He allowed it to become uh, the Bible. And, and that's what you and I can go off of. And so we're not going to cut any verses out. We're not going to skip any verses. We're going to read them all. And it's a very important verse. It is. Look at it. Look at verse number seven. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You will hardly find a verse in the Bible that explains the Trinity in a simpler form. Why in the world would we take that verse and pitch it? Why would we throw it out? Uh, I, I don't understand all that. You know, I, I don't get that. It's God's Word that needs to stay right there. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Son, and uh, the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. One, amen. That's a hard principle to teach a, a young child, but you know what? As we grow and understand, we know that we don't have to understand everything about God in perfect clarity. It's hard for us to realize that, that God is three different parts. Uh, the best way I can tell you to look at it is you are very similar in three different parts, right? You are a body, you are a soul, and you've got a spirit. Uh, another way to look at it is an egg. It's got a shell, it's got the whites, and it's got the yolk, right? So there are many things that we can use to picture this, but again, I don't think that you and I will ever fully understand everything that God is or everything that God is capable of. He is so far beyond what our human minds are even able to uh, fathom. Amen. When, when the Bible, I'll tell you this, I'll, I'll give you one that, that gives me fits in my brain is God has no beginning. How in the world? I mean, that'll just that'll just mess you up, man. Thinking about how in the world does, does somebody have absolutely no beginning? But I, I tell you this, it's true. Amen. He has no beginning. And guess what? He's got no end. How in the world can you live forever? He's got no end. I'm telling you, it'll scramble your brain, turn into fried eggs if you're not careful. You think on it too hard, and, and we just can't fathom everything that God is. Uh, there, there's so many things like that. And so you and I need to simply understand, listen, I'm a person. I have a flawed understanding, and so I can take God at his word and realize there are things about him I cannot physically understand, and that does not negate the truth about him. Amen? What uh, some of these people that uh, prescribe to, to some of these scientific theories and, and different things is they will capitalize on those areas that you and I cannot explain. And they'll say, well, how can God exist because he has no beginning? And how can he have no end? And, and all these different things. And when you really break it down, uh, they have to have just as much faith as we do to believe that two elements floating through an eternal universe collided and then happened, right, to, to just uh, randomly form a, a perfect uh, uh, you know, a uh, uh, form of chemicals to, to allow life to have, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And so for them to say that, that we have nothing to go on is the same argument that we have for them is, is, listen, you don't have any concrete evidence that the world was formed that way either. And so here's what I, in my brain, choose to believe, and, and I know that it's true. I've got the Holy Spirit inside of me that bears record of it. Amen. Uh, I know that I don't have to understand everything that God says he is. I can simply be okay with not knowing. Amen? And there's fruit of him in my life. 
I feel him, I know him, I know he moves, I see his movement, and so for me, that's enough. I don't have to know all the ins and outs. I'm glad one day we will know all the ins and outs. Uh, can you imagine being in heaven? How many questions will you have for God? I, I'm telling you what, God better have a whole lot. I know he's got a lot of time, but I'm telling you, for all the questions of every person that goes to heaven, there's so much I want to ask. There's so much I want to know about who he is and what he's done. It'll be amazing to, to have that knowledge and look at it and say, man, it all did make sense. And it was me being a flawed person questioning. It was me being a, a, a human not capable of understanding. Who are we to question God? Amen. So as the Bible says this in verse number seven, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Do not cross that out. Do not take that out of your Bible. That is God's Word, and it's a very important verse. Verse number eight, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. Again, you can look at uh, Jesus being baptized and look back at that testimony. God the Father, right, is recognizing the Son with the Holy Spirit who descends on him uh, in the form of a dove, right, sits on his shoulder. And so uh, we can see and, and know that, that this is true, that God bears record and God witnesses of who Jesus is. And all three of them testify to be uh, one being. Amen. Verse number 10 says uh, this. I'm sorry, uh, verse number 11. And this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is, watch this, in his Son. Again, Jesus is the life. He is the only way to receive this life. And then the Bible is going to get into some very uh, comforting verses for you and me. Verse number 12. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And then watch this. Here's a, a verse that will give you comfort. If you want to circle this or underline it, this is a verse you can go to. It says, these things have I written unto you, that ye believe on the name of the Son of God. Watch this. That ye may know ye, that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Listen to this. We can know that we have eternal life. It's not a guess. It's not a, a gamble, right? We don't have to, to live the best life that we can possibly live and hope that at the end of our life it's enough. Uh, we don't have to, to cast our lots and... Uh, here's one of the most despicable things I ever heard. Uh, a friend of mine named Adam Walls, uh, he came and, and, and preached a message, and he was showing some different things about uh, what some of the, the prominent religions in their area was. And he brought these little slips of paper, and they were white slips of paper that had these uh, little maroon inscriptions and gold entrails on them and all kinds of different things. And what that was is it was a form of money. And what they would do is they would give their money to buy these slips of paper, and that's what bought people's souls into their heaven, right? And it's not even a heaven that we would see, but it's uh, their form of heaven. And so can you see how that is just a money grab? Can you see that? I don't think Christianity is a money grab. I really don't. I don't think that we're about money at all. I think that money is a small part of who we are, and all it does is go out to reach the world. Amen? It does not buy our religion. It does not buy our salvation. But these other religions, I'm telling you what, you pay for those little slips, and the rich people that can afford a lot of those slips will go to heaven. Listen, aren't you glad that that's not the theory that you and I prescribe to? Aren't you glad that, that, that we have salvation? And not only do we have salvation, that we know that we have salvation. You and I can rest in the fact that, man, at the end of my life, I will be in heaven. And I can say that. You know, one of my favorite questions in the world is what's printed on the back of our tracks. You ever read the back of our track? It, it starts with one question. Do you know for sure where you will be in eternity? You can phrase it like this, too. Do you know for sure if you die today that you would go to heaven? And you know how many different answers I get to that question? I'm telling you what, the, the, the thousands and thousands of people, I, I get so many different versions of the same thing, and it all basically boils down to, well, I think I do or well, I hope I will, or I think I might, or, you know, you, you've heard them all. And you know what? There's so many religions out there that do not have a yes or no answer to do you know if you'll be in heaven. And I'm glad that you and I have that answer. If you've been looking for that verse, circle, I'm telling you, it's one of those verses you can go back to and find strength in when you start to doubt or when you start to doubt the, uh, the method of God's salvation. Have you ever been there? How do I know I'm saved? I prayed a prayer, but I don't know if I... Prayed it enough. I had a guy back at Hillsboro that used to call me, 
He used to call me every day. I had to set it up where he'd only call me on Wednesdays because otherwise I'd only spend time with him on the phone and not get anything else done. But he would have the same questions each and every time. How do I know that I'm saved? And, and when I pray, uh, I didn't necessarily believe on the Holy Spirit. I just kind of knew about Jesus. Is that enough to be saved? And, and then he called back the next week. And, okay, well, now that I'm settled on the Holy Spirit, I, I didn't really know if I knew everything about God the Father. So am I still saved? If I pray? And I'm like, listen, you've got to understand, if you pray and accept Jesus, you're saved. Amen? It's as simple as that. And you can know that you're saved. There's no method. There's no hoops to jump through. There's no... Uh, higher levels of that. No, listen, it's as simple as God has put it. If you shall confess his name, you shall be saved. Simply put. And we can know that we have salvation. So keep that verse. Uh, and that's one to memorize. If you're talking to somebody, if you're somebody who likes to witness and talk to people, that's one for, That's one to memorize. Write that one down or, or memorize it. Whatever you have to do, circle it and memorize that verse. Verse number 14 says this. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions uh, that, we, uh, that we desire of him. Now, now listen to this in verse number 14, because we'll get a little bit mixed up in our minds that if we ask God for anything, he'll give it to us. Right? That's the, that's the mind, that's the wrong mindset that people will grab a hold of. Is if I ask God for something, he will do it. According to this verse, if I ask God to do anything, he will do it. Can I show you something in this verse? In verse number 14, it says, and in, in, this is the confidence that if we uh, that we have in him, that if we ask anything, watch this, according to his will. People skip that part of the verse all the time. If I ask, I'll receive. If I knock, it'll be opened. If I, why isn't God answering my prayer? I've prayed and I've asked and I've, you know, uh, expected of Him and all these different things. You miss the part of the verse according to His will. God's will is always first. When you and I pray, uh, when we ask the Lord to do things, we always need to consider that His will is ultimately the most important thing in that prayer or in whatever we're asking for. I'm not praying that God go my way. I'm praying that the situation go God's way. Amen. That's the way to pray. Not that God comes and bends his will to me, but that my life would be bent to his will. And my mind and my thoughts and all those different things need to change that God's will is always acceptable in a situation. Otherwise, it's very easy to get mad at God, isn't it? It's very easy to have problems with God. If you don't understand this truth and and you skip that part of the verse, it's very easy to get frustrated with God. Uh, well, God, I, I've got a daughter who's sick, and she's been in the hospital, and I've been praying, and why aren't you answering me? Sound familiar, right? That God, I've been struggling with this, and I've been asking for this, and blah, 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 and God, you've not done it. And God, you, and uh, there'd be so many accusations, so many different things that we could bring against God, but he says, no, 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 it's according to his will. When we ask according to his will, God is faithful. He wants the best for us. See, people have this, uh, this opinion of God that, that God is here to manipulate and to torture and all these. No, 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 listen. God wants the best for your life. And ultimately, God wants you to accomplish his will. And here's what we've done is we've made a spectacle out of God's will. You ever heard that? You ever heard that before? You ever, you ever talk to somebody about what God's will is for your life? And, and all, haven't you always for your whole life chased that? Like, what is that, what is that magical thing that God has for me that my life was ordained? And God's will becomes this fairy tale, basically, that we chase until we find it. And, and listen, folks, here's what I can say. Follow God's general will for your life, and he'll give you his specific will. But I can also tell you this. God is not the author of confusion. See, people also have this idea that, that I'm seeking God's will, and I've got all these different paths to walk down. What if I choose the wrong path? Listen, friend, if you're listening to God, he doesn't want to confuse you, right? His, his, his whole goal is not to give you so many paths that you don't know where to go. God is going to clearly right, lay those things out and where you need to go. He opens doors. He closes doors right, when we don't need to be there. And it's up to you and I to learn God's hand and to know when he's moving, when he's not moving, when he's opening doors, when he's shutting doors, and then to have enough faith to walk through those different steps of life and respond to his leadership, always praying according to his will. And so we've made this spectacle of God's will that it's this, if I get it right, you know, I'll, I'll accomplish God's will. No, no, listen, God wants you to accomplish his will for your life. You've just got to be faithful where you are, serve where you are, and God will help you find it. And again, I, I, I would take the focus off of 
that finding that, that thing and, and focus specifically on God's general will for your life. And that is that you read your Bible, that you have a good prayer life, that you be in church, that you be faithful, that you be serving and witnessing and all those different things. I'm telling you what, when you're taking care of all those different things, that's when God will bring about his specific will for your life and what he wants you to do. As simply put, that's the best way to put that, that's the best way to phrase it, is God will show it to you. You just gotta be faithful and allow him to build you into what he wants you to be before you get to that point in life. And isn't that the hardest thing to do is wait? We've just gotta wait. We've gotta wait for God to make us. We've gotta wait for God to bring us through enough trial and enough things that God says, okay, now you're ready. I'll remind you this, Jesus was how old when he began to minister? Do you remember that? 33. He was not 12. I mean, I know he was teaching at 12, but, but, but his ministry began later in life. And so God was making him. God was developing, right? And I know that he was perfect, but, but he was allowing him to, to gain and, and wisdom and all these different things. And so here's what I'm saying. God is doing something through your life. God is allowing you to become something so that he will use you for his specific will in life. So don't get frustrated. Don't, don't uh, get frustrated with God because he's not answering your prayers about his will. Just know that he has a will for you, and you will find it if you're following him. Amen? Isn't that easy to, to understand and easy to know? And I'm glad that that's how it works, that I can find his will if I'm just faithful to him. Amen? A couple more verses here. It says this in verse number uh, 15, And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin, uh, which is not unto death, he shall ask, he shall give him life. Uh, for them that sin uh, not to death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin uh, not unto death. We know that whatsoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. So the Bible covers a, a lot here in these verses, but it does say this, that there is a sin unto death. In other words, there's a point in a man's life where he can be so given into sin uh, that he is completely and totally uh, shut himself off to God's will, uh, and then what is the purpose of his life? I'll remind you that your purpose here on earth is to serve God. And so if you're still here and you're still breathing, God still has something for you. I know that God has something for me because he woke me up this morning, amen, and somebody got saved. And so that was a part of God's will for my life today. And I'm looking forward to God's will for my life tomorrow. Lord willing, he allowed me to wake up, right? And so I know that if I wake up, he's got a job for me. So here's what he says, that there is a sin unto that. There, there is a point of life where you and I can become so given to sin and become such a part of the, the world and become so integrated into sin that, that you and I no longer have any purpose. We no longer have any uh, uh, ability, right, to, to serve God because of how wicked we've become. Uh, simple illustrations, you know, you go back to Abraham, or, uh, I'm sorry, Noah. Right, with, with the generations that lived with him, and they were so given in sin that the thoughts and their imaginations, their heart were wicked, exceeding full. Go back to Lot, the city around him, everything that they thought and did, and actions, and I'm telling you, it, it's all over the Bible. So there is a, a point in life where you and I can reach unrepented. That's what unrepented sin does, is it brings us to that point where hopefully, you know, that's what Satan's praying, is hopefully I can get them there. Uh, but when we repent, right, we turn around in our tracks and turn away from those sins. So that's why it's very important that you and I are always dealing with sin in our lives, not allowing it to progress, not allowing it to reach that point where God says, okay, you want your way? You can have your way, right? I, I'm done with you and I'm not going to use you anymore. I don't want that to become my life. I say this to people all the time when they talk about God's will. I, I don't know how uh, uh, you know young men surrender to preach and then here they are 10 years later and they have nothing to do with the Lord. I don't understand it. I don't get it. I can confidently tell you this. I surrender my life to Jesus. If I quit today, I expect God to kill me. I do. I don't think that's a joke. I don't think it's funny. I think God would literally remove me from this earth. Why? Because that's why I'm here. I'm here to serve him. I'm here to serve him with my life. And I know that that's what God has called me to do. And so if I was doing anything else, I don't think God would be pleased with me. Amen? Simply put, I really don't. I think that my life is here for one reason. And so I think I need to accomplish what God has for me. Otherwise, what is my purpose? And so we need to always be very considerate of what God is doing and what God wants to do through our lives. Again, not allowing sin to deter that path, to switch it, to get it off tracks, to, to move it. Right? We need to always be repenting of that sin, not letting it build up to that point where God can no longer use us. 
And then he says this, there is a sin that's not to death. So he says there's a sin that's to death, and he says there's a sin that's not to death. And if you find a brother in that state where he's sinned not to death, right, that's the time to work with him, right? That's the time to say, hey, buddy, let's get this thing right so that you don't end up there, right? Let's deal with it. Let's work on it. Let's get you, you know, to where this isn't a temptation anymore, and let's move away from it. And we ought to do that out of brotherly love, work with each other and help each other, not bring each other down and cast stones and all the different things that you and I want to do, but help each other so that somebody doesn't reach that point where sin has become so uh, engulfing in their life that they're completely engulfed by it. We need to help each other to stay out of sin. Uh, you know, I hear all the time about people that have accountability apps and different things on their phones, and they've got somebody that they can use and they trust, and you know, they bounce different things off them. Hey, I'm struggling with this this week. Will you pray for me? And we ought to all have those people. You should have somebody in your life that you can go to and say, listen, I need prayer because I'm really struggling here. It'll be a big benefit to you. We need to have those people that we can rely on, amen, and you need to be that person that somebody can rely on, not somebody who's pointing fingers and not somebody who's condemning, but somebody who can be relied on. If somebody needs something, they can come to you. And we ought to all do that out of brotherly love, out of the love that we have for those people that are saved. We can do that and we can better each other because we've got the Holy Spirit of God inside of us. And then it says this in, in verse number 19 through 21, and, and we'll finish for tonight. It says this, and we know that we are of God and that the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true, even his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal Life circle. If you're not gonna circle anything, circle that verse right there. This is the true God. Amen. When I show up to somebody's doorstep, I am not preaching to them somebody who's died and laid in a grave and is gone. That's not what I'm preaching. I'm preaching a God who came, a God that died, and a God that resurrected, and a God that lives today, and He is the one true God. I don't have to guess. I don't have to, uh, you know, speculate and do all these. I can tell them truth because I have truth. I can preach to them the one true God and be confident. I'm not believing a lie. I'm not selling them a lie. He is the one true God. And then it says this, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. And again, I think those little children are you and me. We're the sons of God. We're his children. He says, keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourselves from all these different things in the world. That's his final thought. What a, what a way to wrap that up. God says, listen, simply put, keep yourselves away from idols. Love me, love my children, and keep yourself away from idols. And I'm telling you what, if we'll take God's word and learn, I'm telling you, friend, we can stay away from some of the things he talks about, like this unrepented sin and this sin of the death, and we can be better off from turning and realizing and studying and knowing God's word and be better off because of it. Amen? And so that's the, that's the goal and that's the point when we read, is that we're receiving what God has for us out of his word, knowing that we don't have to walk the same way as the world. I say this all the time, and I'll be done. A GPS is absolutely no good if it stays in the glove box. Amen? You ever been in the car with somebody who, oh, no, I know the, I know the. No, you don't. Get the GPS out. <laughs> you do need the GPS. Amen? You need it. Use it. Why not? It's a tool. It's a resource. You might think you know your way through life. Use God's word. Amen? We need it. So let's do this. Let's stand. We'll pray. And uh, we'll close this evening's service. Lord, we love you again. We're so grateful for you. Lord, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word, God, that we can read and count on. Uh, again, Lord, you said so many times in Scripture, even this evening, Lord, that uh, you are truth. You are the one true God. Thank you, Lord, that I have truth. And God, I pray that you'd help my heart, my spirit, Lord. I pray that you'd help me to grow in your truth. Committing it to my heart, committing it to my memory. Lord, always resting in it, Lord, always being assured by it. And so, God, as we read and study and Lord, we try to better ourselves for you. God, I pray that you'd be working in our hearts. I know that your word never returns void. God, I know that you're always working and moving. And so, God, tonight I pray for your movement, your people. I pray, Lord, that you'd be changing our hearts and changing our minds. Lord, that we'd become more like you and more dedicated to you in our lives. And so, Lord, thank you for truth. God, allow it to affect me. Allow it to affect my heart and my mind. And God, make me more like you. One of my favorite verses, Lord, you know this, is he must increase and I must decrease. And God, my prayer is through my life that you would increase and that me, myself, would decrease. Lord, there would be less of me and more of you. And so God, accomplish your will through our lives. We ask you, please, be with this church. Guide us, direct us, 
Jesus' name we pray. With every head bowed, every eye closed, the Lord has spoken to your heart tonight. Maybe you just simply need to come and respond. An altar call doesn't always have to be uh, a weeping, crying, uh, you know, sadness and sorrow. Hey, listen, if you just need to come respond, God, come and respond. Uh, but be real. Let the Lord work. Let him move. Allow him to accomplish things in your life. Let me ask you this. You know, we spoke with a man today that has lived nearly his entire life and has not been saved. Maybe there's somebody in this room who's been in church their whole life. Maybe has heard the gospel multiple times. But tonight, you don't know that you have eternal life. According to 1 John chapter 5, we can know. And so would you be that person to say, hey, I'm not saved, and I'm going to leave this place knowing that I've been saved, knowing that I have eternal life. Because according to the verses we read today, you can know that. Don't leave this place without knowing. So if you need to be saved, you come. If you're somebody who just needs to respond to the Lord, you come. I'm going to bow and I'm going to pray. And as I bow and I pray, you come. I'm going to ask the Lord to do His will in your life. So I'm going to bow. I'm going to pray. You come. tonight again I, I think that these services are so crucial so important I remember when I first started coming to church I thought why in the world do they meet on Wednesday it was weird enough that I was going to a church that met on Sunday night I found out that they didn't only have Sunday morning church but they had Sunday night church and I'm like man they are really asking a lot and then my dad said put your baseball bat away we're going to church on Wednesday night I said what in the world but I'm telling you what now that I'm saved these are some of the most precious services. These are some of the most precious times where in the middle of my week I can come, be refreshed, hear God's word, have him move. I'm telling you, I love it. So let's do this. Let's pray. Don't ever take the church for granted. Amen. We, we learned that through our quarantine, but we'll be blessed because of his word. Brother Barry, you pray for our services and we'll go. Dear Lord, we come to you tonight thanking you for your many blessings. Father, we are so thankful for our church that we can come and we can gather and we can listen to your word father and we just thankful for our pastor pray that what he teaches us that we apply to our lives pray now as we go a separate way that you might lead, guide and direct we give you the glory and the praise